Hello everyone, hope you're all doing okay. This video is a long time coming, but I'm finally going to try my best to explain the Riemann hypothesis. Well, not quite just the Riemann hypothesis, but I actually want to show you how you yourself can find the first few non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function uh, using something as simple as a graphing calculator. In fact, I'll be using Desmos, which is a site that if you're not familiar with, you should be. It's a fantastic resource to have. Especially as a student, or really anyone that's curious about uh, just math in general, you can graph and really solve a bunch of different equations using it. But uh, mainly it is a graphing calculator at its core. So <clears throat> the first thing to discuss is the Riemann zeta function, zeta of s. Now zeta of s is defined as the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the s, where s is a complex number. So what we say normally is that it's a number plus another number times i. The notation gets a little weird, but um, the standard notation for, for zeta is sigma plus uh, t times i or i times t if you like. Or of course i, if you don't know, is the square root of negative 1. Uh, basically i squared is negative 1. No real number satisfies that, but we say i is a number that satisfies that if a number, such a number existed. That's kind of the idea. So the first real issue here is the way we define the zeta as this sum, it really actually only makes sense when this sum actually converges. So when does this sum converge? Well, we need to know a little bit of calculus in order to see uh, really what's going on. But the big idea is essentially p-series. If you recall p-series, this looks kind of like a p-series, only with s instead of p, and it would really only converge if s was bigger than 1. But because we're dealing with a complex number s, we can't just say it's bigger than 1 because there's two components to the number. So the way we do it is this. We look at the absolute value and see when it's basically um, absolutely convergent. So notice this, of course, is equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the s, like that. And now, of course, by the triangle inequality, we can do this. And it takes a little bit of know-how, but as it turns out, this actually splits up in the following way. Now, of course, the thing inside the sum can be split up even further because absolute value splits up multiplicatively. That's fine. But what's kind of strange is this part. So because in this part the power is imaginary, what ends up happening is its absolute value is actually equal to 1, believe it or not. And I'll justify that here uh, right now. So if you have the absolute value of any number to an imaginary number, here's really what happens. So if I have n to the i t, and I want to take the absolute value of that, we have to know a little bit about something called Euler's formula. And basically what it says is that e to the i theta lives on the unit circle. And it's, well, because of Euler's formula says e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So I'll kind of use that here. I'll, of course, have to rewrite this as e to, uh, to a power. So I'll say it's e to the ln of this, we use log when dealing with complex numbers. Not that big of a deal, but you get e to the log of that. Now, of course, by exponential rules, we can actually pull out the it. I'm not really super concerned about that. I'm concerned about pulling the i out, believe it or not. So what we end up getting is e to the i log of n to the t. And all I really care about is the fact that this right there is a real number. And e to the something times uh, i lives on the unit circle. And how I know that, again, is because this is cosine of that plus i times sine of that. And if you take the absolute value of this using complex numbers, what is that? It's the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. But notice cosine squared of something plus sine squared of that same something is just 1. So in fact, yes, the absolute value of this is equal to 1. So that justifies that statement. Further, since n is positive, any positive number to any power, regardless if the power is positive or negative, is also positive. So we can get rid of the absolute values altogether, um, along with getting rid of that n to the it, because again, the absolute value is 1. Now again, sigma is what is the real part of s. So in fact, this is equal to 1 over n to the real part of s. And again, by p-series, this only converges when that power is bigger than 1. So in fact, all we can say so far 
is zeta as defined only converges when the real part of s is bigger than 1. So this is great if you want to calculate values of zeta, for example, zeta of 2, zeta of 3, in fact, zeta of any number bigger than 1, like 1.1, 1, 1, uh, 1 plus 3i, anything that's basically to the right of 1 on the complex plane. And of course, what that looks like is something like this. So if you're plotting the complex number s and the real part of s you want to be bigger than 1, well, this, of course, is when the real part of s is equal to 1 on this line. So anything to the right of this will do. Perfect. So this is where this sum is true. Now that actually doesn't mean that this is the only way of defining zeta, right? There could actually be other ways of defining zeta that also satisfy being equal to this sum in that region that I've shaded in green. What I'm really talking about here is something called an analytic continuation, which is a very, very common phrase you'll hear when researching things like the Riemann hypothesis or the Riemann zeta function in general. But what this really means in just kind of layman's terms is if you have a function that its graph is a particular type of shape, it can possibly be extended beyond for all values. A pretty kind of low level way to discuss this is let's say we have a curve that looks something like this, right? And let's say it only exists to the right of this number that I'm plotting on the x-axis. But maybe there's some other function that also has that shape, but it has other shapes beyond on the left side. So maybe there's something that looks like this, but then after this point, actually continues and behaves the same way as the curve in black. So this would be a so-called extension of that original function or a somewhat continuation of that function or of that curve onto points where it didn't initially exist as previously plotted. The word analytic though basically means there's an extra requirement involving derivatives that in order to satisfy that part of it, there's only one true continuation that would be the analytic one. And as far as picture goes, it's kind of what you would guess that it would look like if you knew a part of the curve. Now this one I'm drawing is probably a pretty garbage example, but basically if you imagine drawing, for example, the right part of a parabola, then you might imagine that if you continued it to the left, you would just get the reflection. It's probably a very simplistic way of thinking of it, but that I think will make sense. So now the big question, how do we actually make this continuation a reality? Well, Again, the reason why this is only valid when the real part of S is bigger than 1 was because of P series. So if you recall in calculus 2, something you'll see along with P series is the alternating series. In fact, the P series very much reminds me of when P is equal to 1 anyways, is the harmonic series. And this probably will remind you of that. If you actually look at the alternating harmonic series, that actually converges where the harmonic series did not converge. In fact, if you take a look at the alternating P series, the alternating version of P series, that actually converges when P is just purely positive. So let's take a look at what that would look like in the context of the Riemann zeta function. So this is basically what we get, and we call this the Dirichlet eta function. So this symbol right here is a Greek letter eta compared to the Greek letter zeta here. So now if you just consider the alternating series test, what you realize is that the sequence that we're looking at that's alternating is 1 over n to the s. That's actually how the alternating series test works. We consider basically the non-alternating sequence over 7 over. And the question is, is it decreasing and is the limit equal to 0? So as it turns out, this is uh, decreasing when the real part of s is bigger than 0 and the limit actually is uh, equal to 0 when the real part of s is also bigger than or equal to 0. Because then basically you have infinity uh, to a positive number, which is infinity in the denominator, that whole thing approaches zero. So you can take a look at these two conditions on your own, but this is basically the case when the real part of s is bigger than zero. So what we end up getting finally is this following thing, that the eta is actually valid for when the real part of s is bigger than zero, whereas zeta is only valid when the real part of s is bigger than one. So now the big question is, how do we actually relate these two? So if you wrote them out, it'll be pretty obvious to see what's going on. They're very similar, only eta actually has the even values being negative. Just like that, not to confuse my fives with s's, sorry about that. Now, what you'll notice is if you just add these up, the even ones cancel and you get the odd ones. However, the odd ones aren't what we want to keep here. What we want to keep are the even ones. 
It's not obvious at first glance, but the reason why is because they'll all share a common factor of 2 in the denominator. You can factor that out and retrieve zeta back, believe it or not. Let me show that here. This is exactly what I was talking about. So when you're subtracting these things, the odds actually cancel, and the evens now double up because double negative is positive. So in fact, we get double of every of the even terms. But further, all of these even terms have a 2s factor in the denominator in common. You can factor that out. So let's do that now. Great. And now what do we notice? Well, this part, that is zeta. So in fact, we have a nice connection. We have a very strong relationship between eta and zeta. So let's write that and let's actually solve for zeta. Now one really quick way of solving this is to just swap these two. I don't know if we've seen this before or not. This is something I very like to show students. It's something called the different swap. At least I call it different swap. And that is if a is equal to, let's say, b minus c, then adding c and subtracting a from both sides simultaneously will give you the c is equal to b minus a, swapping the difference. So applying that idea here, we end up getting the zeta of s minus 2 over 2 to the s times eta is equal to eta of s. In fact, notice this uh, 2 over 2 to the s can be written a little more compactly as 2 to the 1 minus s. And further, these two uh, zeta of s factors can be factored out completely, giving us this fantastic equation. There we go. So what does this actually tell us? Well, basically, if you were to divide this whole thing by this chunk, assuming it's not equal to zero, and you can kind of see when it is equal to zero if you wanted to dive into that on your own. It ends up being zero for particular values that look like log base two of something, not very important, but they end up being on the imaginary axis, and uh, zeta, as it turns out, is non-zero there. It's kind of hard to show that, but um, I'm not going to really talk about that here. But again, you can see when that's the case on your own. But what I'm curious actually in is when zeta is equal to zero, when the real part of s is in between 0 and 1. And in fact, I didn't really discuss that too much here, but as it turns out, it can be shown kind of easily that if the real part of s is bigger than 1, zeta is actually non-zero. And in fact, zeta does actually attain the value of 0 sometimes, and when it does, it's, well, of course, when the real part of s is less than 1. And what we actually really care about is when the real part of s is in between 0 and 1 strictly in between 0 and 1. There's actually a very famous result relating to the prime number theorem that says that uh, zeta of s is non-zero when uh, the real part of s is equal to 1. I won't be discussing that here. All we really care about is seeing when uh, zeta is equal to 0 when the real part of s is in between 0 and 1. Now the fantastic thing for us is that eta of s is defined when the real part of s is bigger than 0 using this sum here. Zeta, as previously defined with the sum, is really only valid when the real part of s is bigger than 1. But if you can get zeta in terms of eta, then you can write zeta in terms of a sum that's valid when the real part of s is bigger than 0. And that's what we'll be doing. Another pretty important fact that I'll be taking advantage of here is the fact that you can see from this green boxed equation is when you have a number s, a complex number s, that is a 0 of zeta, it must also be a zero of eta. The other way around actually isn't necessarily true. Eta, as it turns out, has more zeros than zeta does. And you can kind of see that here, because like I said, this is zero sometimes. So what we're curious about is are the zeros of zeta. So it is true that if you have a zero of zeta, it is also a zero of eta from that expression in the blue box. So now what I really care to do here is to find the zeros of eta, not zeta. Now, very similar to how as previously described, we can actually split up n to the negative s in this way. Now, earlier I did n to the s because it's focused on the denominator, but here the same thing can apply, obviously, when we have a negative power. That doesn't really matter. Also, we can rewrite n to the negative it part as e to the something. In fact, it's e to the i times something. And because it is e to the i times something, we can split it up using Euler's formula yet again, just like this. Now, some pretty obvious trigonometric identities can be applied here. Also, we can split the sum up into the real part and the imaginary part. And to make uh, the calculation of decimals a lot easier, I'll of course have to replace sigma with x and uh, t with y, because of course what uh, sigma and t represent are the real and imaginary component, which remind us of x and y on the complex plane. The last thing I've done here, of course, is replace log with ln, even though I said we use log when it comes to complex numbers. 
As it turns out, the inside here of the logarithm is a real number, so we can change it back to ln, because that's what log really means. We need it to be the natural log. We use ln when it's a real inside instead of a complex inside, but I digress. Great, so we have eta was equal to that thing, but we want eta to be zero. We want to find the zeros of eta. So notice what we actually really have here is a complex number, where the real and imaginary parts are these crazy looking sums. But as it turns out, when a complex number is zero, well, that's when the real and imaginary part are each zero. So in fact, what we'll be doing is basically graphing each of these sums equal zero on Desmos. Now, a few really big important things. Desmos doesn't actually like infinity. It understands infinity in specific cases. If you're dealing with improper integrals, it actually knows what that is. And if you actually want to type in infinity in Desmos, it's just I-N-F-T-Y like that. And that'll actually spit out infinity. As soon as you type in the Y, it'll turn into infinity. But with sum notation, with sigma notation for sums, it doesn't like infinity for some reason. So what we'll do instead is we can call it K and let K tend towards infinity. Or if you want to take a very large number up there, like 10,000, you can totally do that on your own as well. But I will say that the larger the value is for the top value of the sum, the longer it's going to take Desmos to graph, especially if you're very zoomed out on the graph. So let's take a look at those graphs right now. So to show me typing it, um, it's SUM for sum, and then you go from 1 to, well, one, 1 infinity, but let's again call it K here. And now remember, this is alternating, so we have negative 1 to the n minus 1 power. Now when you type in a power in Desmos, you type in n minus 1, uh, this sort of thing happens where the negative 1 drops down, so a quick way around that is to type in the negative 1 first, and then to go back and write the n. You can of course use parentheses as well, but I think this is a little better. Now we had n to the negative x times cosine of what? It was y ln of n. Now maybe it's a good time to bring up that the imaginary part was negative, but when it's equal to zero, you can just divide by negative and it's positive anyways. So that actually doesn't really matter. Now the next thing I'm going to do to make this quick is I'll actually just select all of this and copy and paste it and then replace the cosine with sine. And there we go. Now, the reason why Desmos isn't graphing is because we want these to be equal to zero, and I kind of forgot that. So let's type in equal zero, and then equal zero. Now, uh, I'm not actually zoomed in correctly here, so I'm going to press home. Also, I should mention this, that we want k to be not just one, so it's not graphing anything for that reason. So I'm going to go here and let k be equal to 100 to start things off, and it gives us some really interesting um, image here. And uh, these are what I've been calling fingers for a while. Now, what's weird is that when you actually let k goes towards infinity, they kind of disappear and you just get an image in between x equals 0 and x equals 1. Now, where you start to really see things make a lot of sense is when they're the same, right? They're both equal to 0 at the same time. Not just 0 once for one and then a once for the other. At the exact same time, they're both zeros when eight is zero. In other words, we're looking for intersections. So here, right there, we start to see actually a false intersection. Not necessarily that it's false, but if k is larger, we'll kind of see it start to go away. Another thing maybe to bring up is that uh, here, this is when the real part of s is actually equal to one. Now you can see that x is one here clearly. So if we keep scrolling up, Again, it takes a little bit of time to uh, load. We see our first hit right there. Now, something that you could do, it doesn't actually matter too much, but something you could do if you wanted to is switch X's and Y's, and then you'll get the same image, but now instead of looking up and down on the things vertically, we'll actually be looking more along the X axis instead. So sometimes that's a little easier to scroll, but it ends up being the same thing anyways. So you can see here the x value of this point of intersection appears to be around one half. It looks a little less than one half actually if you zoom in, kind of like I have here. The purple part of the graph is a little bit to the left of x equals one half where it intersects the red graph. But if we crank k up to 1000, I have to wait a little bit for Desmos to make the change. There we go, it just did it. You can actually see the purple has actually gone closer. So in fact, this is the first zero of zeta, where the real part of s is in between zero and one. Now I should say there are other zeros of s beyond zero, meaning when uh, 
the real part of s is negative. And in fact, they only occur at the negative even integers. And it's a very obvious uh, statement once you know something more about zeta that's called the functional equation. And the functional equation is an equation of symmetry that allows you to relate parts of one side of this so-called critical strip to the other side. Now, I don't really want to talk about the functional equation too much here, but I will say that because of it, it is very obvious that zeta is equal to zero when you plug in negative even integers. And in fact, that's the only time zeta is zero when the inside is negative. The only other time zeta is zero is when the middle part of s is in between zero and one. And uh, this is the first instance of that. Now, when I say first instance, I mean going up. If we go down, it's actually reflective. And let's actually take a look at that. So let's zoom out here and let's scroll down. Now, again, uh, Desmos struggles a little bit to draw some things. So I'll actually crank uh, K back down. And you know, uh, K being like 10 doesn't really hurt. So I'll just kind of zoom out a bit here. And then notice if we go down to negative 14 for Y, we start to kind of see the same basically intersection, but on the opposite side. So as it turns out, uh, this uh, image is very reflective across the X axis. Okay, so now uh, the question is, what is the next zero? So first off, if we scroll back up here, Our first zero is uh, one half plus 14 point something times i. Now it's basically 14.14 something. It's a really weird number. Um, I'm not sure if it is known to be irrational. I believe it is. There's no closed form that's known, I don't think yet. Um, there are ways of finding it using integrals. That's all I'm gonna say. But it's nice that we can use Desmos to get an idea of what that value is. The problem is that on the app version of Desmos that I'm using here, um, it doesn't actually give me a decimal approximation. We just have to kind of look to see. You can kind of zoom in here, and you can see that we can kind of get closer and closer. And in fact, again, if we crank K up, it seems to have disappeared. Let me zoom out a bit. Wait a little bit. We're kind of zoomed in, so my hunch is that we'll actually see a really nice image in a bit. It's going to take a while for it to think, but there we go. So yeah, we can see it's, if you zoom in, it's about 14.1413 something. In fact, if we increase K again, we can try to get more accurate, but this is kind of the best we can do, uh, using decimals anyways. If you were to use uh, some numerical methods with integrals you can get pretty close as well but uh, they're very hard to describe so the best I'm going to do is just display it like I have been here. Now, so what's the next one? So we have one half plus 14 something times i. So what's the next one? So let's zoom out and again kb and 10 is fine just so we can kind of quickly render this image. So you're going to have to wait for Desmos to think again but there we go. Zooming back out again if we scroll back up uh, this next finger is a liar because you can see that actually the real part of s is equal to 1. And again, th those aren't actually valid. This is our next one. And again, it looks like it's a little bit off. But if we let k be 100 now, it starts to go back. And that's not too bad of an image, actually. So it's 21 point something, basically. And let's zoom back out again. And keep scrolling back up. Our next one is about 25 after that. And if you keep going, then we have 30 point something. Now, as it turns out, all of these values seem to lie on the uh, line when the real part of S is equal to 1 half. That right there is the Riemann hypothesis. If you can prove that, then you've proven the Riemann hypothesis, and you also get a $1 million prize. Now, I'd love to talk more about the Riemann zeta function and the Riemann hypothesis, but I think I'll save that for another video. Hope you enjoyed this video and this different format that I'm uh, messing with here. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below and like and subscribe if you're not subscribed already. And I'll see you in the next one. Take care.